Joining us is Dr. Chad Penn, Associate Professor of Soil and Environmental Chemistry. Recently, Chad, on another show, we talked a bit about uh, fertilizer pollution in our waterways, and um, particularly phosphorus, and some of the negative impacts. <coughs> um, obviously, the best thing we can do is limit the amount of phosphorus we're putting into our systems. Uh, but in older residential areas where there's been a lot of fertilizer put in over the years, that tends to build up in the soil. Yeah, that's a big issue in, uh, in soils that have been built up with, uh, with phosphorus over the years because uh, unlike nitrogen, phosphorus tends to hang around in the soil for a long time. And, uh, and if you build it up enough though, um, a, a small amount of it will, will become soluble and, uh, and leach out and, and particularly run off uh, every time you get a rainfall event. Just a little bit every time, but that small amount of dissolved phosphorus that's transported uh, can have a big impact on downstream uh, aquatic ecosystems. Mm -hmm. That's where we see those really big algal blooms. Yes. So you've been doing some research on a filtering mechanism and this is uh, some of the applications. Um, we're in a, a golf course setting. This is the main drainage channel coming out but could also be put into residential areas that have drainage systems. Yes, basically this the, the, the philosophy behind this the target is dissolved phosphorus, and that dissolved phosphorus can come from, from anywhere. It can come from um, agricultural settings, residential, golf course, uh, whatever it might be. Um, now, the two main forms of phosphorus that is transported is uh, particulate phosphorus. That's phosphorus that's uh, absorbed onto sediments. Mm -hmm. And then the other form is dissolved phosphorus. And um, particulate phosphorus, we can stop the transport of it relatively easily by simply controlling erosion. Okay. But for dissolved phosphorus, um, even when you control erosion, if you stop erosion, um, the dissolved phosphorus keeps moving. So if your soils are built up very high in, in phosphorus, even if you stop all erosion, you can still have a significant load of dissolved phosphorus, which is important because when phosphorus reaches a water body, if it's in the dissolved form, it's immediately 100% bioavailable to the uh, aquatic organisms. Whereas when sediment, the particulate phosphorus that's bound on a sediment, when that reaches a water body, it may or may not be mm -hmm. bioavailable to the organisms. So from settle. that perspective, mm -hmm. uh, dissolved phosphorus is a more potent eutrophication uh, chemical. Okay. Well, tell me a bit about the research um, and the system that you've been working with to try to scrub that phosphorus out of water. All right. The idea is uh, there are a lot of uh, byproducts, a lot of uh, waste materials from different industries, mm -hmm. um, from producing uh, power, uh, uh, coal-fired power plants produce certain byproducts, uh, production of steel produces steel slag, that's what we're looking at here by the way is steel slag, um, drinking water treatment residuals from treating uh, drinking water, um, boundary sands from the iron and metal casting industry, and it turns out that a lot of those materials have a very, very high affinity for phosphorus. They'll absorb a lot of phosphorus. And the idea was, well, can we use these materials and make a giant landscape filter mm -hmm. and set it out in the landscape in areas, in hot spots, uh, I like to call it, where there's a high concentration of phosphorus uh, moving through it, strategically place it through so that the water flows through the material. It's just like a, think of it as like a giant Brita filter where uh, mm -hmm. the uh, dissolved phosphorus moves, uh, uh, flows through it, drains through it. In this case, you can see it, it uh, flows into these pipes right here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a distribution manifold underneath there of perforated pipes that evenly distributes the water throughout the uh, absorption material, in this case steel slag, and it drains straight down through and, and sticks to it. It absorbs to the media and then the clean water drains, drains out. And the, the idea is that once this material becomes saturated with phosphorus, it's contained. Mm -hmm. You can actually clean it out and remove that phosphorus from the watershed and then replace it with fresh material. And you have some monitoring equipment nearby that helps you keep track of those flow rates and also measure the phosphorus coming in and coming out, um, yes. which could be a good tool for uh, someone else to apply in determining when it needs to be changed out. Yes, that, that, uh, that, that, that's correct. We have, uh, if you look right here, we have some, uh, this is a, a basically a point where a sample is taken during a runoff event. So we have a, a flow meter inside the drainage pipe down there and it's constantly monitoring flow rate. And when, the, and when it detects 
uh, a high enough flow rate. I, I believe we have to have it set for a gallon per minute. When it hits a gallon per minute, it tells the sampler to turn on. And it takes a sample right here of the water coming in, and it also takes a sample of the clean water, the treated water, coming out. And uh, also kn by knowing the flow rate, we put that together the concentration, then we know the mass of phosphorus. We could say that there's a certain number of pounds of phosphorus that flowed into the structure and then a certain mass of phosphorus that flowed out of it with the difference being what was retained in here. And through that data, and especially with the data that we have uh, produced in the laboratory with all these different byproducts, we've produced a, a model that can aid in actually designing these structures. So the, the end user, or the, the field practitioner, could take this model, take the software, and um, collect data for his site. How big is his watershed? How much flow? How much runoff is flowing at the particular point that he wants to treat? What's the concentration? And what materials does he have available to him? What, what byproducts is he have available to them? And characterize those materials. Plug all that into the model, into the software, and it will essentially estimate for you how much of your material you need and how it should be oriented. How big does it need to be? How deep does it need to be to meet your flow requirements? Because if water doesn't flow through this, it doesn't work. It's not good enough to just have water flow over the top of this. The water actually has to flow through the material. So th there's quite a bit of, uh, of uh, design that mm -hmm. goes into these things. And I understand you're in the process of patenting that um model, the computer model. Yes, so yeah. Congratulations. The, oh, thank mm -hmm. you. The, 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 the idea is, the hope I should say is that uh, through uh, the OSU uh, Intellectual Property IP office, they, they would like to take the software and then be able to license it to uh, you know, potential entrepreneurs who would like to build these mm -hmm. structures and provide that service to um, anyone who wants it, either in the agricultural sector, the golf course sector, um, residential. It's a great way to start treating some of the problems that we're seeing. Clean water is so important to our environment and I'm very excited to get to experience some of the research and see how it's working firsthand. My vision is that someone will um, pick this up and take it and start to uh, actually start to implement it throughout in watersheds throughout the United States, anywhere where there's excess nutrients. That, uh, that, uh, that's, that's my goal. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.